Welcome everyone to Physics 1B. My name is Dr. Daniel McEwen, and I'll be your professor for this second session of the summer. And I would like to introduce myself first. Um, I've got my PhD from UCI, and I worked there for a year as postdoc. And um, I've worked in the area of dark matter research, uh, particularly indirect detection of dark matter. I have a one hour long documentary on dark matter where I talk about that on my YouTube channel and specifically go into detail about my research. And then currently I'm researching with Professor White in the area of partial measurement and quantum computing. Basically we're looking at systems of entangled qubits and using things like iTensor to do analysis of what happens to the information when we do a partial measurement. It's a very fascinating field. Um, quantum computing has really taken off in the last couple of decades. And there's a lot of people who enthusiastically believe that before too long, we're going to be doing some really big calculations on quantum computers. A few things have already been done, but it's still in its infancy. And so for those of you who don't know, quantum computers are um, computers that use objects called qubits instead of bits. So a classical bit is either a one or a zero. It's represented by a voltage gate in a computer and it uses silicon and as a material for this. Qubits though, they have two basis states, a one and a zero, but they exist in a superposition of one and zero simultaneously due to the laws of quantum mechanics that's possible. An object can have some probability if we measure it of being a one or a zero, but if we don't make a measurement, it can be a superposition of both states. And you can do a calculations with qubits where the super uh, position of the qubits actually causes a new type of calculation. And we can actually factor really large numbers and things like that by taking advantage of that. The details of it are very complicated, require a lot of um, building up to, and we're not gonna go into that in this class. But the reason I told you is because I want you to know that there's a massive potential for physics right now. And unfortunately, the leaders of our country and the, certainly the leaders of our university at UCLA do not realize that. They have not put the proper respect into physics that should be placed, including uh, professors who teach. Some professors do well, but some professors such as myself are not doing well financially right now. And that's because of the lack of respect that the university as a whole has for physics, or I should say the lack of awareness that they have of how important physics is. I can tell you that there is not a single field that exists that has not been basically, you know, if not totally, at least partially um, influenced by physicists. If you want to talk about computer science, physicists did invent the internet in order to send data from university to university in the 1980s. And then it was later harnessed by businesses and companies for commercial gain. But the idea of the internet did not come from business people. It came from physicists. Um, obviously, the devices that we work on now, the computers and things, those were not invented by Apple or Microsoft or IBM. I know I know Microsoft doesn't do a whole lot of hardware, but the point is, is that from the computer languages to the hardware to everything, it was essentially invented by physicists Shockley and Bardeen. Uh, Bardeen, John Bardeen was somebody who won the Nobel Prize twice in physics, one for the theory of superconductivity and the other one for developing the transistor which is the reason that we even have computers today because they have those transistor components. So the point is, is that um, I've done some public outreach and I've gotten a shocking realization that society is ignorant of physicists, especially in America. The United States has one of the most uneducated populations in terms of STEM and they don't know how important it is. And I, I'll tell you something, economically, if, if this persists, this could be a real problem for advancement. We may not see the same level of technological advancement in our lifetime that the prior generations have seen. So far, the 21st century has been a big disappointment compared to the 20th century, the pace that they were keeping with, with innovation. And I would argue that it's because 
less investment in the physical sciences. Okay. And then this disastrous situation where almost nobody who gets a PhD in physics even becomes a physicist. You're just supposed to go and leave academia and get a job doing something that you didn't get any training for. That's a total waste. That'd be like somebody with a medical degree who learns how to do heart surgery and then they can't even operate on patients and do heart surgery. And then there's bunches of people dying from, because they need heart surgery done, but there's nobody there to do it and nobody's hiring them because there hasn't been a space made for it in the economy. Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? It is ridiculous, except look at how bad our infrastructure is. Look at how lousy the traffic situation is in Los Angeles. That's all due to bad engineering and a lack of good physicists in there. The um, There's people that could go in and could solve those problems with people with PhDs in physics and in the other areas, engineering as well. And those people are not being given a place or a say in our economy because a few people at the top have essentially kind of they they have control of the system and they're not really doing a good job. Anyway, I know that not everybody likes an introduction like this, but I honestly this is I this is how I feel and so that's how I'm going to express myself in this first lecture. So, that being said, let's go ahead and talk about this class and what it's going to be like. So, this is 1B. Now, I have a different style than um a lot of other people who teach physics. First of all, the homework is going to be graded on completion. It's not going to be graded on accuracy. You're going to have as many attempts as you want to do the homework problems. You're supposed to make mistakes on the homework. Mistakes should be made because that's how you learn. You learn by trying something and making a mistake. I don't like the mastering physics software because it automatically takes off points. You can do certain settings on there, but the multiple choice problems, they take off points regardless. When you're graded for your homework, it, whatever your grade says in the mastering physics, if it says 92% or whatever, if you attempted every problem, you get 100% on the homework, okay? Because I want you to try different things and I want you to make mistakes. You'll learn from those mistakes. What I don't want you to do, I don't want you to look up the solutions to the problems and just try to get a perfect homework score and not really learn the material. I want you to read through the problems, work things out, try to figure things out. You can work in groups, bring the questions to discussion sections, and really you know, make the effort to really learn this material because I'll tell you, it's very, very fascinating and very important. So that's the first thing, the homework grade, as long as you do all the problems and attempt all the problems, you get 100%. So that's something that's different. Another thing that's a bit different is that I'm actually not going to teach the fluid dynamics content first. We're going to go straight into electrostatics. And the reason for that is because I've never taught this course before. It's my first time teaching 1B. And I want to make sure that we have enough time to hit the most important material. The fluid dynamics is important. In fact, if you're going to become a physicist, it's just as important as the electrodynamics, but, and the electrostatics, I should say, but a lot of you are going into engineering. So, you know, that's more important to invest the time in on the circuits and the basics, the fundamentals of electricity and magnet, or, well, in this class, electricity, you'll do magnetism next time uh, in 1C. But anyway, so we're actually going to jump into the, um, the chapter with electrostatics today. And we're going to do Gauss's law and we're going to do circuits and capacitors and dielectrics. And then after we do all the electricity stuff, then we're going to go back and we're going to do mechanical waves and fluids and stuff. So we'll see how much time we have. So the bulk of the content is going to be focused on the electricity stuff, you know, doing, knowing Gauss's law, knowing how to solve circuits all that stuff. It's very important, um, especially for all of you engineers there. So we're going to put an emphasis on that. So I do that a little differently. Um, my style is that I believe in doing lots of examples. So I look at PowerPoints from other professors. The biggest problem that I see is a lot of derivation and no follow-up examples. I want to do it in the reverse order. I'll do some derivations. Derivations are great. It's great to see how the laws are built up from both experiments and from mathematical reasoning. That's a beautiful thing. But 
these physics equations are tools. And it's like, I can bring different tools and show you, hey, this is a hammer, okay? This is a wrench. That's what a derivation does. It basically just shows you the tool. It doesn't show you how to use the tool. So lots and lots of examples are gonna be in these lectures that you're gonna watch. There's gonna be a very, you know, it's gonna be a very in-depth class. Um, and we're gonna do a lot of stuff. And then another cool thing is I'm sometimes I'm gonna bring uh, material from other um, books, not just the one that we're using. I, occasionally I'll bring in examples from Feynman lectures on physics. And I think you'll really like that because it's a really fascinating book. It doesn't get taught very often because it can be very challenging. Some of the examples are beyond undergraduate, but I pick, I only pick like reasonable examples. I'm not going to pick stuff that's beyond what you guys would be expected to be able to do. So we're going to do that too. We're going to bring in some really cool videos, some demos and stuff. If we were in person, if this wasn't an online class, we could do in-class demos. I've done in-class demos in the past. I've never done any for 1B or, or else I would include them as part of my presentations. I have recordings of my 1C demos and my 5A or 5B demos, but I don't have anything for 1B because I never taught it before, but I will eventually. Um, so, but we'll we'll still see some great demonstrations and stuff. And then we're gonna have office hours a couple times a week. In the beginning of the class, I am experiencing a situation right now where my internet connectivity is a little bit um, broken because I've I'm looking for a new place to stay. Uh, there's an issue where UCLA is only paying me seventy thousand dollars a year, and I can't afford housing anymore. And I was kind of in denial about how low the pay was, and I thought I could make it. But then I really went through and budgeted it and realized I couldn't. And I asked the department for an increase in pay, and they've refused. So I actually had to leave. I had to leave Westwood. I'm in the process of looking for a new place, and I've got a good place to stay. I'm okay. But it's not like it was before where I just have internet whenever I need, want it. So because of that, especially in the first couple of weeks of the course, there will be some office hours, but I want you to go to discussions. That's where you're going to get most of your homework questions answered is in discussions because normally I do lots of office hours. That was a big part of the way I did things. But unfortunately, the UCLA physics department didn't appreciate my efforts and they're not rewarding me with a sustainable pay. So now we're in the situation where I can't even do office hours because I can't live close enough to the school because I can't afford the housing my apartment was $2,500 a month before utilities, which is expensive. And after taxes, I'm bringing home less than 50 grand when I have a PhD in physics. It's an absolute disgrace. UCLA physics should be ashamed of themselves. It's under terrible leadership right now. The whole university is under horrible leadership. And I'll tell you something. I'm glad we have a new dean or whatever, a chancellor, but I'm, I'm not convinced that that's enough. We very well may need to get completely new leadership. Anyway. That's the last I'm going to say about that. From here on out, it's only in the first lecture, maybe the first couple of slides too. But everything else from here on out, it's just going to be physics. But I wanted you to know that's the situation that's going on because it's relevant. Okay, so in this class, you're going to learn some amazing facts and applications about our universe. You're going to learn how electric charge and current works, how electric potential and electric power work, you're going to learn Gauss's law and all about electric fields. You're going to learn about capacitors and dielectrics and how to solve circuits. Very exciting. And then at the end, we're going to do some stuff with fluid mechanics, oscillations, waves, and perhaps sound. And that'll sort of probably be like in the last week to week and a half. But we'll still do some great stuff with that too. But the emphasis is on all of the other bullet points first. Now, this is my message. So I said there'd be a couple more slides about this. So physics needs to change. These are some of the problems. Almost no one with a PhD works as a physicist. Companies steal ideas from researchers and researchers are poorly paid. Apple stole a bunch of ideas from the computer science department at University of Michigan, and they were sued for hundreds of millions of dollars. That's how much they stole from University of Michigan and University of Michigan professors won the lawsuit and got the money from Apple. But that happens a lot of times. All that self-driving software that Tesla uses was obtained from the work of researchers at MIT, computer scientists doing machine learning with self-driving software in the 1980s and 1990s. Not saying all of it was taken, but a lot of it was. 
a lot of graduate students do groundbreaking research and they do ne they never get fairly compensated for it. And also people who are not just graduate students or postdocs too, and even scientists. Yeah, some scientists do pretty well when they get the grants, but the handing out of grant money is extremely political, extremely unfair, and people with connections know how to write the letters and they get the approval. It's just like as political as Washington as you could ever possibly imagine in Washington, D.C. So there's huge problems with the funding aspect of it, too, and it's it's honestly not right the way that the funding is done is either. The biggest problem, too, is that universities are run by leaders who don't understand the value of physics. They may be president and they may have gotten a degree in something like law or who knows what, but a lot of them don't really know a damn thing about physics and they don't really understand how important it is and how it's transformed our world. They're poorly educated in a way. They're they're limited. And they they their budgeting shows that they think physics – is less important than football. And I can tell you something, your life is not one damn bit better by even a fraction of a sec, by even a fraction of a bit by the outcome of a football game. It does not make any difference. People can say, oh, it matters so much to me. That's fine. It's imaginary. The importance, the impact that the outcome of a football game actually has is zero. It, it does nothing to advance humanity forward. And yet we waste hundreds of millions of dollars on it coaches getting at UCLA getting paid millions of dollars that's a disgrace and then they pay me seventy thousand dollars a year when I have a PhD in physics and I have tons of knowledge no that's going to change that's unacceptable okay UCLA I mentioned this before it's done a terrible job with its physics program recently I want to say the students are wonderful and all of the graduate students that I worked with too are wonderful. They want physics to be an amazing thing, but you know what? The people in charge, they're out of it. They've been, they've been clueless about this. They don't realize how bad of a job they're doing because nobody's confronted them. The people in charge at the UCLA physics department, they, they're, they're totally out of touch with reality and with how bad of a job they're doing. And that's the truth. But the students are amazing. I don't have anything bad to say about any of the uh, graduate students that I've worked with um, over the past year that I've taught there. Um, and then, yes, professors are often elitist and un unhelpful. We all know this. Let's just be honest. Um, a lot of professors have really big egos, and they're honestly difficult people to deal with. I had a lot of difficulty dealing with professors, by the way, when I was a student, too. Um there's some who are really amazing people. When you meet a professor who does help you, there's nothing more amazing than that. It makes such a difference. The professor that I'm researching with now has been really amazing. And, and I cannot say enough wonderful things about him. But, you know, it's just that's a problem, though. We have to and we have to keep in mind we have to not be elitist, too. I have to always keep that in mind to try to not become that way, too. Right. Because no matter how much success I get. I need to not let it get to my head too. So I think that's something we all have to keep in the back of our minds because it could happen to anybody. Okay, so this is my fear. If we do not improve educational programs such as UCLA physics PhD programs, we as a nation could descend into a new dark ages. Advancements in science in the 21st century have already not kept pace with the 20th century. That's absolutely true. Americans are more poorly educated, especially in math and science, and value knowledge less than at any other point in history. Look at how popular these flat earth theories are. Look at how people can just feel comfortable just going on with these crazy nonsense, non-science ideas and be like, hey, I think this is true. I don't believe in science, whatever. Yeah, because it's not valued. And then some of these people are executives, right? Some of them work in business. Some of them have a lot of power. Some of them are politicians, right? Some of them maybe were former presidents and they don't have an understanding of science. Do you think that has a positive impact on us as a country, as a nation, as a society? I don't think it has a positive effect at all. And I think weakening scientific programs and not compensating people who do great work as teachers, professors who teach, not compensating them, Fairly, that's a sign of the decline. 
So billions of dollars wasted on gambling, sports, and other fruitless endeavors. Meanwhile, the cities are crumbling and the homelessness continues to rise. Look at all the homeless people there are, even on campus. There were homeless people that were like apparently roaming the halls of the physics building. And you know what? It's tragic. I'm not pointing fingers at the homeless people. Housing is extremely unaffordable in, in Los Angeles and people either can't afford it or maybe they have mental health struggles or drug struggles. They can't get the help that they need. Everything is so poorly run and there's no focus on fixing these real problems. So it's a disaster and that's a sign of that. Okay, so this is my message. Physics needs to change and here are my solutions. We need to increase funding for physics programs by diverting funds away from wasteful spending, uh, from overinflated salaries for sports programs, et cetera. We need to move away from the modern university as a corporation model. It needs to stop being run like it's a corporation where it's like profit is all that matters. And they need to have more transparency in their budget because tons of money is either being wasted or funneled away secretly into the pockets of people where it doesn't belong. And that's obvious. Uh, the university should focus on the pursuit of knowledge. That's right. You know, athletics is great. And I support student athletes, by the way. Whenever there was a student athlete who needed to go out of town for a game, I would accommodate them and I'd let them take the exam uh, with the, the proctor. I wasn't heartless. I have res a lot of respect for athletes and the great work that they do. I'm not here to attack student athletes. I don't think they're the problem. I don't think that student athletes are given enormous, ridiculously overinflated salaries. I think that the money is being invested in the sports facilities and it's being given to coaches. They're paid too much. But it's not just the coaches. It's a lot of other things. There's just this big network that doesn't really need to exist because when you think about it, sports is a very like, you know, it's an important thing for those who are playing it. But the focus of the university should not be sports. It should be academics and it shouldn't even be 50 50. That's not that doesn't make any sense at all. If that's not how it was historically. It, in the past, the universities did not spend nearly as large of a fraction of their budget on athletics as they used to. So the final point, professors should all be paid a livable wage. I don't care if you're tenure track and you have, you know, a thousand awards or if you're just teaching physics, they find a way to get a lot of work out of all of us. And so professors like me right now, yeah, I don't have a whole lot of publications. I'm working on more, but right now I primarily teach, but that doesn't mean I should be paid dirt for it because I still have an enormous amount of knowledge, as much knowledge as somebody with a medical degree. And you know what? There's medical doctors, right, at different levels, right? We've got brain surgeons and heart surgeons. They're going to make the most. But we also have general practitioners. And you know what? The general practitioner doesn't get paid $70,000 a year. They have as much education as me. They don't have more education than me, but they get paid way better than that. It's a disrespect to physics, a profession, that they pay anybody as low as $70,000 a year. That makes everybody look bad. And honestly, I told Pear, hey, you know what? You make yourself look bad when you pay me that low of a wage because you're nobody even takes physics seriously if you think you can pay somebody that poorly for their knowledge base. That just devalues all of us. It just makes us all look bad. That's how foolish it is. Okay, so that's it. Now let's do the first lecture for electric charge. Experiments in electrostatic. We've got some results. Negatively charged objects repel each other and positively charged objects and negatively charged objects attract. So we've got charge. We've got a positive charge and a negative charge. They're carried by electrons and protons, respectively. The electron carries the negative charge. The proton carries the positive charge. And if it's a positive and a negative, they're going to attract each other. If it's in a negative and a negative, they repulse. And if it's a positive and a positive, they also repel each other. So opposites attract and same uh, repel. So here's some experiments that show that. We've got the interaction between plastic rods that are rubbed on fur. When we do that, the plastic, before the plastic rods neither attract nor repel each other, but then we rub the rods on the fur. And then after being rubbed with the fur, the rods repel each other because there's a negative charge on both of the rods. What happens is the rods, we rub them both on the fur and there's a piezoelectric effect. And it's it's the this effect where certain materials, when you rub them together 
um, you essentially, you acquire electrons and people can do this too. You can rub certain substances and you can collect electrons. We do that with the, um, the two plastic rods. We rub them on fur and they, uh, they acquire electrons. So there's a net charge on each of them. We bring them together and we can actually see a repelling effect. It's easier to see this though, when you have something dangling that has a net negative charge and then you do this. And then when you bring the rod closer to it, it repels away, okay? So there's a force that charged particles exert on other charged particles. They don't exert them on themselves, but they exert them on other charged particles. And that results in either attractive or repulsive forces. So the interaction between glass rods, we take the glass rods and we rub them on silk. And then after being rubbed with silk, the rods repel each other. But this time, the glass rods, when we rub them on the silk, they didn't gain electrons. They lost electrons. Electrons went from them onto the silk. Well, what happens is losing electrons is the same thing as gaining a positive charge. So if you were neutral and I and I give you electrons, then you're no longer neutral, you're negative. But if you're neutral and I take electrons away, like in this case, now you're positively charged. And that's what's happened with these glass rods. They've acquired a positive charge. So then we have an interaction between opposites, objects with opposite charges. So the fur rubbed plastic rod and the silk rubbed glass rod, well, they're gonna attract each other because the plastic rod has a net negative charge and the glass rod has a net positive charge. So they're gonna, their charges are going to attract. And the fur and silk each attracts the rod it rubbed. So see, we've got attraction here because we've got a positively net charge to here and a negative here and a negative here and a positive here. So these are going to all attract because opposites attract. So plastic rods and fur are particularly good for demonstrating electrostatics. And electrostatics is the interaction between electric charges that are at rest. So the charges are not moving. If the charges are moving, then they also produce magnetic fields. So we're not gonna talk about that at all in this class, except in the context of circuits, but we're just gonna ignore the magnetic field that a current will produce You'll do that in 1C. You won't, we won't talk about magnetic fields. But a charge that's not moving does not have a magnetic field. It only has an electric field. So that's what we're going to talk about in this class, in 1B. So these experiments and many others have shown that there's two kinds of electric charge, the kind on plastic rod rubbed with fur and the kind on the glass rod rubbed with silk. Ben Franklin suggested calling these two kinds charge positive and negative. And he got it reversed. So what he thought was uh, positively charged is actually negatively charged, but it doesn't matter. The convention works as long as we're consistent. Negative charge moving this way is the same thing as positive charge moving this way. So we can treat charge as moving positively around in a circuit and that works just the same as if we said, nope, it's negative and it's going the opposite way, which I get is a little bit strange to think about, but it sort of makes sense if you if you think about it intuitively, right? So that's the truth is that they got it reversed because they didn't know about electrons in Ben Franklin's day, but they did get it right that there's positive and negative charge only, and they completely nailed that, and that's correct. So that convention exists to this day. So two positive charges or two negative charges repel each other. Positive charge and a negative charge attract. Great. So then we've got a picture of the atom. Now, here's a problem. What about the atom, though? The atom's got a proton and an electron that we've heard circles around. it. First of all, it doesn't orbit the proton. That's totally wrong. It, it acquires this kind of weird, uncertain location. And it's described by a wave equation. The electron is... The, the proton is essentially uh, stationary and it's so much more massive that we don't have to worry about the wave-like behavior of the proton. That's the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. You can do that and you can just approximate it as just there. And then the electron just kind of waves around, although there is a wave function that describes the proton as well. But we don't have to worry about that unless we go really far deep into the proton and start looking at the 
quantum behavior in the proton itself, which we're not going to do in this class because that's nuclear quantum mechanics, right? That's going to be advanced stuff. So we're just talking about, you know, the electron. But the point is, is that this rule for protons and electrons attracting, it's not a precise theory of charge. It's an approximation and it's a law, but it's a law the way that the ideal gas laws are laws. It's not really a law. It's just, it's just good enough when we have, when we talk about charges and we don't worry about their quantum behavior, you can't do that for an atom. An atom, in order to make sense of it, you have to immediately treat it with the Schrodinger equation. And that's a totally different thing. But in this class, we're not going to worry about why the positive charge and the, why the negative charge doesn't spiral in to, and it just attract to the positive charge and stick there because it doesn't. And the reason because of that is quantum mechanical. We're not going to get into that. We're just going to say for now that it's it's generally the case that we, if we have positive charge here and negative charge here, they will attract. And typically, we're going to have a lot more than one proton and one electron when we're talking about the charge. We'll have like billions of each, right? It's easy to get billions of electrons on a surface. You can easily do that. Electrons are tiny. They carry a tiny amount of charge. There's so many char there's so many electrons in a wire that's plugged into the wall socket. It's not even funny. There's probably trillions of them. I mean, it's an unbelievably large amount of them, right? So it only becomes the quantum stuff only becomes important when you're talking about really small distances and just one electron or a couple interacting with something. Here we're talking about large scale things. It's macroscopic in a sense, macroscopic, right? Because we have a large number of them. So even if their electrons still remain tiny, a large number of them makes the system macroscopic, then electrostatics, classical electrostatics, as we're going to learn it, applies. Okay, now let's go over a couple of numbers. So the proton has a positive charge. It's got the same charge magnitude as the electron. But look at the mass. It's way more massive. It's four orders of magnitude more massive than the electron. Electrons 10 to the minus 31. The proton is 10 to the minus 27. It's quite a bit larger. The neutron has almost the same mass, not quite. It's a little bit more massive than the proton. And that's because when the neutron decays, it can decay into a proton and, and, and another a couple of other fundamental particles. A little bit of that mass is carried off by those other fundamental particles that it decays into. So the neutron is always a little bit bigger than a proton and it has no charge at all. And then the electron, of course, has a negative charge. Okay, so we have the principle of conservation of charge, which is that the algebraic sum of all the electric charges in any closed system is constant. We can't just make charge up out of thin air. If we had started with this much charge, electric charge, then we end with this much electric charge. That's a very, very fundamental law. That conservation of charge holds in a lot of situations. It's very much a law of, of a rule of nature. Conservation rules are, are generally more fundamental than, than laws <clears throat> and sometimes more fundamental than theories. Conservation's about the most, you know, true as you can get, fundamentally true. The magnitude of the charge of the electron or proton is a natural unit of charge. And then we'll talk about the charge of the electrons. It's measured in units called coulombs, protons and electrons. Electrons minus, you know, a certain amount of coulomb and proton is positive that. And then some materials allow the charge to move easily through the material while others do not. Conductors like copper wire allow it to go through easily and insulators do not. So we'll, we'll show that here. So then we can see a case where a wire conducts charge from a negatively charged plastic rod to a metal ball. So when we connect, we have a net negative charge on the plastic rod from rubbing it with some fur or something. And then if we connect it to a copper wire, then the charge can flow along the copper wire and make it to the metal ball. And then the negatively charged plastic rod now repels the ball because some of the charge jumped onto the ball. So now they're both negatively charged. So it no longer attracts. And then a positively charged glass rod will now attract that ball because it's got a positive charge. 
So that's a, a little experiment that you can do to show the validity of these arguments. It can be easily demonstrated with experiment. Notice that these experiments that we validate classical electrostatics with are macroscopic uh, experiments. There's a, quite a bit of charge that flows onto that onto that ball when it flows from the you know through the insulator or not the insulator through the conductor, right? It doesn't flow through an insulator. It doesn't go through an insulator. It goes through a conductor. So it goes through the copper wire, and but it's a lot of charge. So these macroscopic rules will hold and be accurate to describing their behavior. And then nylon is a good insulator. So if we hook the nylon up to the ball and connect it, no charge is going to flow and everything's going to stay the same. Okay, so charging by induction. We can charge a metal ball by using a copper wire and an electrically charged plastic rod. So I'll show you that figure in a minute. And in this process, some of the excess electrons on the rod are transferred from it to the ball, leaving the rod with a smaller negative charge. But there's a different technique in which the plastic rod can give another object a charge of opposite sign without losing any of its own charge. And this is called charging by induction. So here we have the uncharged metal ball and an insulating stand so that the charge can't flow. If we did get charge, it can't flow from there. <clears throat> then what we do is we take a negatively charged rod and we, we put it up next to the ball. The electrons are free to move on the ball. And what they do is they move away from the negative charged electrons that isn't touching the ball, but is still nearby. They move away from it. And then the positive charges move towards it. And so we have a negative charge on the rod that repels the electrons over to one side and allows the protons to move over to the other side. And this creates regions or zones of negative and positive induced charge. So this is charging by induction. This process really does occur. And so what we can do then is we can hook up a wire there and then the wire lets the electron build up and flow onto the ground because there's now there's a way for the electrons to go and leave and get out of there, that system. Okay. And then the rod is then removed and the electrons rearrange themselves on the surface. Now they flow down to the ground off of there and they're just all around throughout the environment. So now that ball that was neutral, now it's net positive. It's got a net positive charge, which means that it's missing electrons. Whereas before it had just as many positive charged particles as negative charged. Now it has a net positive, so it's no longer neutral some of those negative charges have left. Not all free electrons <laughs> move to the right surface of the ball. As soon as any induced charge develops, it exerts forces towards the left on the other free electrons. And these electrons are repelled by the negative induced charge on the right and attracted towards the positive induced charge on the left. So it doesn't, not all the charge goes. It sort of reaches this static situation where the amount of negative charge that it's introduced, that's only like the amount that can leave approximately. It's sort of like a static situation. And then the rest of the electrons can't go there because they're repelled away from, from, the, from the other system. So it reaches an equilibrium state in which the force towards the right on an electron due to the charge rod is balanced by the force towards the left due to the induced charge. And then if we remove the charged rod, and we didn't hook it up to a ground where the electrons can leave, if we just like, we just move the rod away, well, then the electrons move back to where they were. And the original condition is restored. And we have a net neutral ball because we didn't give the electrons a way to escape with the charged, with a, um, a wire. Okay, here's another example. We can take a charged comb that picks up uncharged pieces of plastic. Now, how does this work? Well, there's electrons in each molecule of the neutral insulator that shift away from the comb. And then as a result, the positive charges in each molecule are closer to the comb than they are to the minus charges. And so they feel a stronger force from the comb. So the net force is attractive, even though the charged particle itself, the charged object of the um, insulator is neutral. So that's an interesting way to see an effect that could otherwise be perplexing. It's like, 
well, why is this attracting? I thought it was neutral. Well, it is neutral, but a negatively charged object can attract a neutral object. Now, what if there was just negative charges on this molecule? No, then that wouldn't happen, right? Because then there wouldn't be a positive end to shift over like that. It's only if it's neutral because then there's a positive component that can move around and 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 face the negatively charged cone. So, and then now we have an opposite situation. We could have a positively charged comb, and this time it's the electrons that shift towards the comb. And so the minus charges now are closer to the comb, and they feel a stronger force from it than the positive charges. So again, there's a net attractive force in this case, too, for the opposite reason. I mean, it's the same reason, but it's the opposite case. The, the comb is oppositely charged. So it's the opposite charge carrier that moves to face the comb. In this case, it's the negative electrons. Okay, let's look at this uh, presentation here of some cool demos here. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit play here. Let's start with an experiment. I have these two spheres and they're painted with paint that makes them conducting. They're extremely lightweight, but they have a conductive coating on them. Let's start with an experiment. I have these two spheres and they're painted with paint that makes them conducting. They're extremely lightweight, but they have a conductive coating on them. Right now, they're both uncharged. This one is on a post that I can move back and forth. But this sphere is at the end of a rod and it's connected to a very, very fine wire. And so there's a force which pushes it back towards an equilibrium position, but it's a very, very tiny force indeed. And this is gonna serve as a balance that lets us measure extremely small forces, specifically the forces between the charges on these two spheres. Now, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take this sphere and I'm gonna give it a positive charge. So right now, both these spheres are uncharged. I'm gonna charge this one up positively. I want you to watch and see what happens and then we'll give you a chance to explain what you just saw. So this sphere charged up positively and watch what happens. The sphere on the left moved toward it, touched it, and then moved away. How can you explain what you just saw? We'll give you some choices. And of course, what happened was this. When we charged up the sphere on the right positively, the conductive sphere was attracted to it. Negative charges built up on the close side, positive charges built up on the far side, Industrial. and so the two were attracted to each other. But then when they touched each other, positive charges were transferred from the right sphere to the left sphere. Then they're both positively charged and they push each other apart. And I can measure the force with which they push each other apart by doing this. I can turn this torsion balance and bring it back so that the sphere on the left is exactly where it started. And when I do that, the dial here gives me a measure of how much force I need to apply to bring it back to where it started. And so therefore, it gives me a measure of the force between these two spheres. So we can use this to make a quantitative investigation of the force between charges. And let's do a couple of experiments. First, I'm gonna start by discharging these two spheres. And this wire is connected to earth ground. And so I'm gonna take the charges away. I'll bring the force back to zero and let the two spheres rest at their equilibrium position. Now let's make the two spheres just touch each other. So the reading on the scale is going to give us the distance between the centers of the spheres. Okay? And the spheres have some size to them. So right now, the distance between the centers of the spheres is about three centimeters. So there's a three centimeter difference with distance between the centers of the two spheres. I'm going to move this a little bit farther apart. So now the spheres are six centimeters apart. I'm going to charge them both up to the same positive charge. And when I do that, they repel, Ooh. as we know they must. There you go. Now we can turn this dial 
and figure out how much force we have to apply to bring them back into equilibrium. And that force is just a measure of how much force there is between the two due to the positive charges. And I have to apply a force of 30 on this dial, and don't worry about the units, but 30 on this dial to bring them back so that they're back in balance with each other. Now, if I take these two spheres and move them farther apart, so I move Newton's them would, so that they're Newton's 12 the centimeters between their center the instead of six centimeters between their center. Here's a question. How would that change the force between the two spheres? We'll give you some choices. Now, I think you suspect that if you move the two spheres farther apart, there'll be a smaller force between them. And in fact, let's measure and see if that's the case. So we'll charge them up exactly the same amount as we charged them up before. There is a repulsive force between the two. But how much force do I have to apply to bring them back into balance? Before, I had to apply a force that was equal to 30. In this case, I have to supply a force of 7.5, one quarter of the force that we saw previously. So I've yeah. doubled the distance and I've cut the force by a factor of four. So the force is proportional to one over the square of the distance. And that's something you'll learn about in chapter 20 that we call Coulomb's law. The force there is proportional go. to the magnitudes of the two charges, and it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two centers. Now, let's take a look at one more problem having to do with Coulomb's law. If I adjust this dial, I can change the voltage. And if I change the voltage, I can change the charge that we put on the two spheres. So I'm going to put it back to six centimeters. I'll discharge the two spheres. And I'll put the force back so that it's balanced. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to decrease the charge on each of these two spheres by one half from what it was previously. So initially, when I charge them up with the full charge, let's call it Q. Each of these gets a charge Q. The force was 30. Now I'm going to charge each of them up to a charge of one half Q. 30 is the force when I have Q and Q, when I have one half Q and one half Q. What would you expect for the force between the two charges? We'll give you some choices. So think about Coulomb's law and what Coulomb's law well, the tells force us. force is proportional to the product of the magnitude of the two charges. Yes. And so if each you of the charges is one half what it was before. One fourth. The force is proportional to the magnitude of the two charges. And so the force is proportional to one half Q times one half Q, one quarter what it was before. Yeah. And so we'd predict a force of 7.5 to bring them back into balance. And in fact, that's exactly what we observe. Okay, great. So that's our, that's our experimental confirmation of Coulomb's law. And I'll get into that in the next class, but we're done with the lecture for today. But when one last point, when he said units, it might not be Newtons, it might be milli Newtons or something like that, but it is units of Newtons of force, just so you know. All right, I'll see you in the next class.